Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for your patience with me today. So this is the start of the video. Hopefully it won't be too long or boring. Okay. So as mentioned, class is canceled today. You should watch this whole video within the next 24 hours so that you're best able to plan for all the work for the next couple days. So I would recommend you just go ahead and watch it as soon as possible because we're going to go over some assignments that are going to be due even after the exam and um, it might be beneficial for you to take the exam earlier so that you um, can prepare for those other assignments. All right, so these are the six things that we're going to do during this video. So first is the exam directions. I already went over this to some degree with you before in that email that I sent you on Monday, but since I've added the exam to Sakai now, I have some further instructions for you, or at least can just show it to you a little bit better. All right, so one thing is that there's no class being held on Monday, uh, the 27th, and so that's to give you time to prepare or to take the exam. All right, so there's no class on this day. You don't need to come to class. There's not going to be anybody there. But uh, I think in the email I told you that you could take it anytime on Sunday or Monday. I think that's also what it says in the syllabus. But when I published the exam, I went ahead and made it available for you starting tomorrow. So anytime starting Thursday at 9 a.m., you can start taking the exam, but it has to be done by the 27th uh, at 11.59 p.m. So it's up to you when you take the exam. It's a two-hour exam, so it's up to you when you take it, but um, that's the window that you're able to take it. So again, you can only take it one time. It has to be done all at once, but you pick the time that you want to actually take the exam. Alright, so where to take the exam? I say choose a quiet place where you have strong Wi-Fi. Having strong Wi-Fi is really important, so you don't want to do it on a place where the Wi-Fi is a little bit weak or when you're on the edge of something or, or anything like that. You want to make sure that you have strong Wi-Fi the entire time. Choose a quiet place. Don't attempt to do it in a place that could get loud. So don't do it in Starbucks. You never know if there's going to be some Buddy who comes in and they're going to be super loud. You only have those two hours to take the exam, so you need to be able to concentrate during that time. So I would recommend the silent floor of the information commons or the library or something like that. Uh, make sure you give yourself enough time uh, to get set up and take the exam. Um, realize too that it might take you a minute to set up your notes, so you know, give yourself like two and a half hours or whatever, um, so you can set up, review some things before you take the exam. Alright, like I said before, it's a timed exam. Once you start it, you'll have two hours to complete it. You'll have more time if you have accommodations with SSWD. There's a way that I could change those settings in Sakai, so you don't even have to worry about it. You'll just log into Sakai and whatever uh, midterm exam uh, you see there, that's the one. Okay. So after two hours, Sakai will automatically submit your exam, so make sure that you watch your time. Okay. You will be able to see all the questions at once. Alright, so it's open note, but you still need to study. So by open note, that means you're able to use any of the documents provided for the class, any of the links provided in the class, uh, any of the videos provided in the class. Um, but please do not take this as a sign that you shouldn't study. Okay, I've mentioned to you, I think, in the first week of class or so, that that people in my other classes tend to do very poorly when it comes to the midterm exam because they say, oh, it's open note, it's going to be super easy. And then it's not super easy. So make sure that you study. My advice is to study for the exam is if you can't use your notes, then once you take the exam, your notes are there if you get stuck. Because if you're flipping through your notes, you're not going to be able to get done in two hours. You're going to be sitting there sifting through pages and pages and pages um, trying to figure out how to answer you know just the first 20 questions or the first 20 points um, so make sure that you're aware that the time does go quickly and you need to actually study all right cheating what's cheating one thing is don't use the internet except for course readings don't use Google to go search for some term that you didn't know what it meant Usually that's going to give you the wrong answer, but in this case, the more important thing is it's cheating. And if I find out about it, then you're going to lose points. How would I find out about it? Well, I've had a, a situation happen before where, you know, several people, maybe like four people, looked up on Google to see who um, 
Jose Saria sorry I was for instance and then they end up telling me something about Jose Saria that is just it's information that's true but it's information that we didn't cover in class and it's missing information that we did cover in class um, and that was for a different class so it might not relate to you but uh, don't use the internet probably you'd be able to do it with getting away but there are going to be um, times when I'm going to be able to catch you so just don't do it all right Point deductions and possible failures. It depends on the severity of the instance, but yeah, you do not want to be one of these people who, who's going to lose a bunch of points because of something like this that you knew about in advance and you could have prepared for. All work must be completely independent. That means, you know, if you are, if you live with your family or something like that, or if you want to do it in your room and there's a roommate in there, don't ask your roommate anything. Don't talk to your roommate or anything. Don't ask your mom or about anything. Like, May, that might seem innocent, like, oh, these people aren't in the class, but it's not. So make sure that you are doing the work completely independently. And, of course, do not work with anybody else in the class. Um, study with other folks prior to the exam, that's totally fine. Um, but once you take the exam, do not talk about it, okay? Don't share resources after you've taken the exam, okay? So you need to absolutely make sure that you are doing it independently. No, no sharing screenshots from the exam, no sharing any questions about the exam, no sharing what, what, what things do I need to focus on, none of that. Don't talk about the exam at all with anybody after you've taken it. And again, point deductions, possible failures, if I find out about anything like that. Okay, so how to access the exam. Let me just go ahead and, and show you how to do that. So you're going to log into Sakai, go to our site, and then it's just testing quizzes. Now this is what how it looks when I view it, um, but when you view it, it's going to look slightly different. Right now, there's nothing coming up because the exam's not available yet. But I think it'll pop up here when your exam is available. Okay, so you will just go ahead and click on the exam, and let me show you exactly what it looks like when you first start out. So I'll just show you the preview of the, of the beginning. So once you click on um, midterm exam A or B, um, whichever one is related to you. Um, so again, it, it, I think I sort of mentioned this, but I, there's, there are folks in the class who, might, who have uh, accommodations related to the amount of time that they have for the exam. So when you log in, it will be the appropriate one. But let's just pretend that yours is exam A. Once you log in, you're going to see these directions, okay? You can only submit the assessment one time. You only have one chance. You get two hours or until this due date. So if you start the exam on the 27th of, of February at, say, 11 o'clock, then you only have 59 minutes to finish it, okay? So the, probably the latest that you can actually start this exam is going to be about 10 o'clock, 9.59 p.m. on the 27th. So my recommendation is not to wait till the end, but, you know, whatever, if, whatever you want to do. Okay, so instead of a password, there's this check for honor pledge. I will not give or receive aid on this assessment. Okay, and then once you click this and click begin assessment, that's when your time begins. And once you log in, you'll see a, a timer there. Some some people get nervous by having to look at a timer, um, so you might have a post-it note ready in case you want to cover that up, because uh, it'll be you'll be forced to look at it. Okay, so that's how you access the exam. And, you know, you just log into Sakai, you do all this stuff. Alright, once you start the exam, you're going to see this table of contents button in the upper left of the screen. Uh, don't click on it, okay? It's available to you. There's nothing terrible that's going to happen once you click on it. But what happens is... What happened to me anyway was that I was previewing it and I was going to try to look at it and then I was like, oh, I don't need this, so I'll just go back. And then I just automatically pressed the back button and then that was just messed up everything. So if you press the back button, it's going to mess up your exam, it's going to submit it, you're not going to have all your questions answered. And because you're going to be able to see the entire exam on the same page anyway, there's no need for the table of contents. The table of contents is really for people who have uh, multiple pages of an exam that they have to look at. But you have one single page with all the questions on there, so you don't even need the table of contents. So don't press 
table of contents button. Also, don't press the back button um, while you're taking the exam. Don't access any other Sakai resources while you're taking the exam. When you're taking the exam, just that should be the only thing in Sakai that you're accessing, the only window that Sakai is open in. All right, potential tech problems. Like I mentioned before, this is the first time that I'm giving an exam on Sakai, but I frequently give exams on Blackboard, and sometimes there I run into tech problems that students have, and it might be user error issues, like pushing the back button when you're not supposed to, or or having multiple windows open, but in either case, I'm just gonna try to give you a few tips. So one is, um, as I mentioned already, make sure that Sakai is the only thing that, that the browser tab you are working on for the exam, that should be the only thing where Sakai is open. Every other window, every other browser, every other tab should be closed if it has Sakai in it. Okay. Now that's going to mean that you have to go into Sakai and get everything off of it that you might need. So maybe any of the of the notes in the resources section or um, any of the links or anything that you need off Sakai, get it before you start the exam. Because once you start the exam, that should just be the only thing that you are looking at in terms of Sakai. You can have another, you can have your browser open to other tabs, but only one should have Sakai open, and that's the one you're taking the exam in. I also recommend this is not required, but but I tell my students who are using Blackboard to do this, just because I, you know it's like every semester I have one or two people who have a problem. So I'd recommend just taking some screenshots while you're taking the exam, just for insurance. Um, but it's super important that you don't share those screenshots with anyone. So you can do it for your own self so that you can um, have some insurance in case your exam gets automatically submitted before you, um, without saving all of your material, but um, don't share those materials. Not this semester, not ever. If anything does go wrong, email me right away to let me know. I'm much more likely to believe you if you tell me right away instead of you know, waiting for me to grade your exam, finding that everything is messed up, and then I ask you about it, and you're like, oh yeah, something something was weird, and, and I didn't quite understand. Just, if you notice anything looking like it's a problem, please email me right away to let me know. Also, if something does mess up, it'll give me some time to mess with the settings and enable you to, to take the exam again. Okay, so that was all for directions. Now we're going to move on to exam preparation. All right, so the study guide is linked in the course schedule. We're going to go ahead and look at that real quick. So um, on the course schedule for today, you have the study guide available. Here's what the study guide looks like. I'm sure all of you have looked at it already. Most of the stuff we've gone over already, um, but it does tell you the structure of the exam. So again, this I will not cheat password is not applicable since uh, Sakai doesn't let me do that. So this tells you the structure. The exam will be a combination of fill in the blanks, about 15 blanks. People complain that this is the hardest section of the exam. Okay, so sometimes those blanks are going to be words that come straight off the notes. Um, other times they're going to be ideas that came straight from the notes, but not the exact words itself. But if you study the context of um, whatever note I gave you, uh, then you'll be able to answer that blank. The blanks to I'm going to tell you if, if the blank that I'm looking for is one word or if it's five, not five words, it's never going to be five, but if it, I'll tell you if it's one word or if it's more than one word, basically. Now, if you can't think of whatever thing I'm looking for and you're able to fill in the blank with something else, that's totally fine, um, but just realize I will grade that. I might not give you full credit even if it does make sense within the blank. Like sometimes I'm looking for something specific. If you studied my notes, if you read the reading, you would come up with it. And you put in a blank that makes sense, but it's not related to all the notes and the readings. So if you get desperate and you can't find the answer I'm looking for, fill it in with something else and I'll, I'll grade that. Um, trying to see if it's close to what I'm looking for. I might give it half credit, I might give it full credit, I might give it no credit. It just depends on how close it is to what I was looking for. I usually try to give you clues though in the rest of the sentences. Um, clues that will help you come up with the word, that, the specific word that I'm looking for. Alright, so there's about 20, so there's about 15 blanks and there is matching. Matching is usually what it starts out with. I just give you 20 descriptions Oh, 20 terms that you have to match with descriptions. Uh, so uh, there's two sections of 10. And that's a lot of points 
just for something that's pretty easy. So make sure that you understand um, all the terminology that we've been talking about or, or any of the terms on the notes. All right, multiple choice, but there's not any on this exam. You do have five true or false questions. All blanks are questions of these varieties will be worth, worth one point. Okay, so these short answer sections are, you have to write one to four sentences, and they're worth four points each. Okay, so there's only four of them, and you have to answer in one to four sentences. Actually, it's, you know, one to five, I think is what I said on the exam, but it's it's almost this exact as this. Okay, so short answer, just one or a few sentences, and that's worth four points, and there's four of those. And then there's going to be these longer questions. There's two of these, and you have to write five to 20 sentences, so a, a good solid paragraph. And there's going to be two of these worth 10 points each. I put these at the end, the longer ones at the end, this one second to the end, but make sure you leave yourself enough time to to be able to, to, to answer those properly. Okay, um, I do curve the exams if it's needed. Um, the last few times that I've given exams, um, th it's either not been needed or I adjusted it by like one or two percentage points. But it's, I, basically I just count up all the A's, B's, C's, and whatever's and try to see whether or not um, my questions were too hard and I if there's a question that so a lot of people missed and I feel like I understand why they missed it, uh, then I would take that into consideration, but it often doesn't happen too. All right, so what do you need to do in terms of studying for the exam? Look at the text main arguments, the key terms, text context, all of this stuff, okay? Issues that were brought up in class that weren't even in the reading, uh, you're gonna, Look at any key sections of the of the text that I pointed out. Connections between the text. That's something that is a little bit more difficult to study. Um, but if you're studying each individually, you'll be able to, to come up with the connections a little bit easier. So you might imagine where there are common themes um, in some of the reading among some of the reading. Okay, so I, I used to have a study guide that just like listed you know, 100 terms or something like that, but decided to, to make my notes available to you instead of providing that list. So then you have the list earlier on. So these are just all the notes that are available to you already. Uh, make sure that you're aware of them. The notes themselves might have ideas, like um, sentences, uh, quotes, or they might just have a single term. If it's a single term, just make sure you understand the context and what it means within um, within the context of the reading. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but if it's a quote, you know, make sure you understand what's what's the point of the quote. What are the lessons to be learned from that quote? Did we talk about that quote in class? What well, what did we decide about it? So you're going to to need to review. Uh, the readings themselves, but you're also going to review these notes and um, have a sense of what all those things mean. So that's going to mean that you're going to have to to look back to the reading to figure out what those terms mean, or look at your class notes um, as well. Okay, so that's it for that. Okay, so other ways to pre prepare for the exam, review your notes. You might work with others too to make sure that you can compare notes because sometimes we're in the middle of class discussion and um, you forget to write things down. So if you can look at other people's notes too, then maybe you can get a clearer picture of what happened that day. Review the main ideas of text, so maybe sections that we, we talked about in class. Um, and when I say text, I mean readings and videos. Okay, so whenever I say texts, that is what I mean. Anything that you had to read, but also anything you had to view. Um, fully understand my notes, and if you're not sure uh, what the significance is of any of the items on the notes, notes then you need to ask me. Um, I mean, you might want to investigate yourself first, obviously. Um, look at the readings, talk to your classmates, but you can also ask me. Look up the context of the notes um, in the text if you don't understand them. I already mentioned that. Okay, we're not going to look at any notes right now. All 
All right, discussed in this video, uh, sorry. So we already did these two, and then now let's talk about upcoming assignments. All right, this, let's just take a breath for a second because this is kind of lengthy. All right, so let's go ahead and look at, um, at the course schedule so that we can have a sense of what's coming up the next few weeks. All right, so last class period we were supposed to talk about the striker reading the notes are available and I will uh, talk to you a little bit about them in a minute but today in class we were supposed to go over any questions you had about this the study guide or any of the notes we were supposed to catch up on Stryker and Bornstein and then we were supposed to talk about these three assignments um, the research project is kind of you know like the big final project for the class it's due um, in April I think but it's due more towards the end of the semester but you have a proposal due coming up very soon and then you have a short paper due r right after spring break so it's important that you know what these things are so that you understand how they're coming up so again let me talk about the relationship between all of these okay so the short paper is just completely separate the short paper is not like a response paper I am gonna give you much more feedback on it and I'm also going to um, grade it much more harshly than uh, the response papers. The response papers you just turn in, I skim them to make sure they're on topic, and then I just give you full credit. The short paper you're going to get an actual, you know, percentage based on what you actually wrote. It's more of a formal thing. You need an intro, a conclusion, a thesis statement, all those kinds of things. All right, so that's its own separate thing. All right, but these two are very intricately related. You have this research project due in April, and this proposal where you are trying to pick a topic for this research project, okay? So rather than just sending you all out on your own and be like, yeah, yeah, spend all this time doing this research project, I make you choose a topic fairly early on um, so that I know that it's a quality topic, um, which is gonna help you get a better grade once you get down to actually doing more on the project, okay? So if you click on proposal, you'll be taken over here to the research project proposal email. So this is, you know, you have a one-page assignment description for this, but it's going to require that you look over at the research project itself, okay? So in order to pick a topic, you might need to know what is the research project itself. So if you click on that, then you'll be taken to the, you know, the final research project assignment description. It also gives you a grading rubric on how it does. Now, this is a pretty long document, but don't get scared about it being long. The reason why it's long is because you have five formats that you can choose for your project. Most people go with a traditional research paper because they find it, maybe the easiest but you have these other options if you want to do a blog a zine a documentary um, using video or documentary or podcast using audio so you have these options and each of these options is going to have its own assignment description section so the reason why the the um, the assignment description is so long is because you know there's basically um, five different sections um, explaining what you should do, but you don't need to read all of them. At this point, you don't even need to choose what the format that you're going to have is. All you need to do is pick the topic. So, um, here's the content requirements. That's probably the most important thing that you need to know at this point. Okay, so the content requirements, and again, this is for the final research project, which is due in April. You're going to create a project that utilizes research to shed light on your approved topic. So that's the topic that you're going to approve through the proposal process. Um, you can choose an organizational strategy that, that you find is going to work best for your, for um, demonstrating this. All right, you're going to have to summarize at least two scholarly articles. This is important not only for you to understand now in terms of what um, what kind of research you're going to have to do for this project, but also so that you know what kind of research you're going to have to do for your short paper, because the short paper requires that you use a scholarly source. So let me just talk for a minute about scholarly sources. Some of you know this already, some of you don't. It really kind of depends on your whoever taught composition to you on, on whether or not this, this got stuck in your brain. But when I say scholarly, I mean peer-reviewed. So peer, um, like someone who is your peer. Okay, so peer-reviewed means that someone who's an expert in the field, usually a PhD, someone who has a PhD, who's a professor somewhere, um, who does scholarly work, that person is an expert in their field, but we didn't just trust that they're an expert in their field, they had to be accepted by other ex experts in the field. So 
Um, take for instance the, the Transgender Studies Quarterly, which we've talked about previously. So the Transgender Studies Quarterly um, exists for other scholars doing transgender studies. They have an editorial board, they have um, uh, editors for each individual issue, they have um, uh, overall editor, they have managing editors, so they're trying to, they also have a publisher who is a scholarly publisher. So all of these um, people and components work together to follow these standards to, so that we know that it's a, it's a scholarly piece. So, so take for example um, someone who is going to submit to Transgender Studies Quarterly. Let's say they have a PhD, maybe they're a graduate student, maybe they're a, um, a teacher already or a professor already, um, and they have written this piece related to transgender studies that they want to publish. So they send their, they could either send an abstract or the whole article. Let's just, usually it's an abstract and then it might get accepted, but then they're going to want to see the article eventually. So let's say they send the article, they send the article to one of the editors. Um, that editor will then look at it and say, okay, this is good enough we're going to send it on to some outside reviewers or the editor is going to say no this doesn't quite meet our standards yet it needs to work on this and this before we can send it before we can seriously consider it so they'll send it back to the author and say you need to work on these three areas and do you know these particular things and then if it got sent back then that person will say oh I need to fix these things they'll work to fix those things then they'll send it back to the editor and if the editor says yes it's now ready to send to these outside viewers um, or readers then that editor who knows a bunch of other people who does transgender study who do transgender studies will send that article on to one of these people one of these people who usually has a field more closely associated with the original author and then once that person has this article, then they're going to give a whole lot more feedback and say, this is really good, this is really solid, but this part needs to be worked on, and this part needs to be worked on, and these areas need to be worked on. So that person gives a whole lot of feedback to the writer, okay? And you and usually you don't even know who this person is. <laughs> You're just trusting the editor to pick someone good. Okay, then that feedback goes back to the original writer, who then works on those things, fixes those things, resubmits. If the editor is satisfied that the writer has followed the directions of the outside reader, they might make a few small corrections, usually related to citations or grammar, like usually the grammar is not bad, but um, you know, typos, things like that, and then they will publish it, okay? And they usually got copy editors and all these other people, all right? That's what peer review means, all right? That's different than, say, a magazine publisher or a newspaper publisher. They're following journalistic standards, but they're not following academic standards. So th they're going to say, oh, well, this seems good enough. We've, you know, found these sources to be credible. We'll publish it. But um, newspapers and magazines and blogs usually are following some idea of, like, the standards of capitalism a bit more than the acad academic uh, journals are, but also just this idea of who's who's approving it, whose feedback is being used. Um, you have people who are experts in the field um, who have done independent research uh, on these issues, like conferring and talking and deciding that this article is good enough to be published in their journal. Okay, so that's a long story just to, to um, have a good sense of what a what I mean when I say scholarly, what I mean when I say peer-reviewed. So for this project, you're going to have to find at least two of those, and for the short paper, you're going to have to find at least one. Um, now, you will have to use other sources, too. They can just be reliable ones. Um, um, reliable can be, you know, newspapers, magazines, blogs, uh, whatever. Not Wikipedia, not, you know, some, some random thing you found on the internet, but something that is a little that you find reliable can be used, but you still have to have these two art scholarly articles. I also think I mentioned that the scholarly articles should be like 15 pages around, at least 10. Okay, other things uh, you need to know at this point, I don't think that was it. Alright, so if you go back to the proposal email, it's going to talk to you a little bit more about choosing a topic. Okay, so now you have a sense of like the, the kind of source requirements that you're going to need. 
but what about the topic? So the research project proposal email assignment description explains that in a little bit more detail. So make sure that you just read through this completely. You see some examples of some that would be appropriate um, to use for a uh, for for this project. Um, it has to be extremely specific, okay? So it can't just be something like oppression against trans people. You know, that's like way too broad. So you'd have to pick something pretty specific. I'm also going to be gathering all the topics to make sure that no one in the class is doing the same project. Okay, everyone in the class has to have a slightly different topic or radically different, but they can't be the same. Okay, so that's why it's important to pick something really specific. This is going to give you a better grade. Um, it's also going to help you do your research so that you're not um, having a hard time um, finding well, what am I trying to say you're this is just better for your grade and it's not just because I'm looking for this specifically like if I just told you you have to write a paper about something um, you're gonna need to find something that's specific so me making that requirement just makes it easier for you to do well all right that being said I want you to pick a project that you feel um, invested in so consider consider choosing something related to your um, major or your minor or something that you're interested in, something that you want to do for a job, something that you uh, care about, some activist organization that you're involved in or care about, um, any of those things would be good to help you feel invested. I don't want you to just pick something random. You're going to have to spend weeks working on this, so it would be, it would be good for you to pick something that you like. Okay, so in order to do this, you're probably going to have to um, do some reading on the topic. So this is not required for the for the proposal, but it's highly recommended that you don't just pick a topic without doing any reading about it. So um, once you pick a topic, you know, search, do some online reading, see if you can find some things related to that. Um, make sure you're calling it the right thing that will enable you to get better search results. Um, for instance, um, for instance, talking about um, well, I don't want to give you too many examples because I'm afraid that will inspire you to choose those topics, and I want you to choose topics that you find interesting. But um, sometimes when you're looking for something, you might call it one thing, um, but when you search for it online using slightly different terms, <coughs> you will come up with a lot more results because that's the more common way to talk about that very issue. So make sure that you try to phrase it to me in a way that that's gonna that is in keeping with the um, typical ways that that topic is being described. That's going to help you in your research and it's going to help me know that you've done some reading on this. Okay, um, alright, so I want you to do this over email. I don't want you to send me any attachments. I just want you to write it in the body of your email. This is a rather informal process but the email is going to let us go back and forth. So if maybe you picked something slightly broad, or maybe you picked something that someone else has already picked, I can email you back and, and, and try to push you in, in a different direction or guide you um, in a different direction so that you can pick something that you like that hasn't already been taken. But, all right, so you just need to include these six things. Make sure that this is the subject line. It looks like there's no space in there. Having a space would be would be good. And sorry, I, I kept this from a, um, a previous assignment description, so this is wrong. So you don't want to put 297. Okay, so do not, do not put 294. Um, put 297. Sorry, because that's the name of my other class that I took this assignment description from. And if I remember, then I'll try to fix that, fix this before then, but just make sure that you put 297 proposal there. Okay. So sorry about that being incorrect. All right, the second thing is in the body email, you know, do some greeting. I think most of you are good at that, but um, in my some of my classes, people aren't, and I want to make sure that people have some experience writing formal emails. Okay, three, tell me your proposed research topic in one sentence, okay? People who write it in like five sentences or a paragraph usually are indicating to me that they're not quite sure what they're picking yet. Okay, so I want it in one clear, concise sentence. Um, Four, tell me why this topic relates to trans studies. I just want to make sure that you've asked that question um, and can answer it, and that's going to ensure that you've picked something that would be more appropriate for this class. Number five, tell me wh why you want to do this topic. 
this kind of seems unnecessary but it helps me out a lot in terms of how to guide you because if you pick something that someone else picked or you picked something that wasn't um, quite uh, specific enough then your answer to this question is going to help me um, you know steer you in the right direction that something that you'll actually like to do all right and then six when you sign your name please include your first and last name Okay, so if you do all six of these things, you're going to get 25 points in the ETC category of your grade, which I think includes like the presentation, some other thing related to, to, um, to the project, to the research project. So um, it might not seem like a lot, but it actually is a lot for that ETC category. All right, but I'm not going to give you those 25 points until your topic is approved, okay? So don't assume that if you send me the email that your topic is approved. Your topic will be approved when I say, consider your topic approved, or it will be approved when I say, yes, this works great, your topic is approved. I will say that very specifically in the email. I will use the word approved. So make sure that you, um, if, I, if I write you back and say, this sounds good, but you need to work on this, this, and this, please write me back then you need to make sure that you write me back, okay? So the deadline for sending this in is, um, is March 1st, okay? So it's the day, our class day after the exam. So it's due on March 1st. That's the day that you have to send the email to me. But um, I'm not going to give you the points until your topic is approved and that might require a few emails back and forth okay so make sure that you do reply to to any of my emails that I send back um, where I, I ask you to, to come up with something different all right so I think that uh, explains the research project in the research project email proposal um, but as you'll notice too this day we come back after the exam you have two readings or two um, documentaries that you have to watch. So one's 50 minutes uh, and it, you have to access this through Loyola. If this link doesn't work, just you know shut down the window and try again. Um, if it still doesn't work after a couple of tries, you can email me because uh, sometimes I've had a problem with this particular link before. So um, do let me know if that link doesn't work for you and, and you've tried it a few times. And then also this this 19 minute documentary. So, even though you we typically think of when you have an exam that after that things are easy in this class it's not like that. Um, so you need to um, be prepared to actually work again for the class on, on on Wednesday. But after that you got spring break, so just just make sure you're aware of what's happening this coming week. All right, all right. We still have to talk about the short paper, so. Again, so this is Monday, no class, no office hours. This is Wednesday, research project email proposal is due that night, but then you have to watch these two films before you come to class. These two are optional. All right, the next class is spring, or the next week is spring break, but the week after that, let's look at that. All right, the week after that, there's a lot going on. One, Senate. Senate, many people find challenging because there are some theoretical components of that that a lot of people aren't familiar with. It's not really long, but it is um, it is a different kind of rating. So give yourself enough time to deal with that. You will have to, um, you know, like with anything, look up any terms that you don't understand, but we will spend two days talking about it in class. All right, you'll also have a response paper due on Senate that night, okay? Then the Wednesday of that week, you have this 22 minute documentary, not too difficult, but you have that short paper due. Okay, and short paper is here, the assignment description is already up. Um, so by up, I mean you can click on short paper and you can find it. So this is it. When I say short paper, it's four to five pages double spaced. And I give you at the bottom exact word requirements 1200 to 1500 words or four to five pages in Times New Roman size 12 font double spaced. All right, you have two options for writing this paper. Option A, do something with a historical figure. Option B, do something with um, an indigenous slash non-Western form of gender variance. Okay, I'm not gonna read this to you now um, because anything that I say will just be, you know, 
already written here so just make sure that you read it that you understand it and that you know that you have two options don't do both just one or the other and then it has to be four or five pages um, all right regardless of which option that you choose you have to follow these other requirements you're gonna have to summarize or cite one scholarly um, source in your topic okay now by summary summarize I don't mean that you have to write a whole paragraph of summary like you might it depends on how you want to organize things but um, you have to be using uh, one peer-reviewed 10 plus pages scholarly article for this this is going to show to me um, well this is going to show me a lot of things but just make sure that you do it When I say scholarly source too, I forgot to mention this, I don't mean student theses, okay? So don't use a student thesis or a student dissertation. Don't use an abstract, because um, sometimes your search results can just bring abstracts. This would not be a student work, and this would um, not be an abstract. All right, so re for research help, um, see reference library, and they'll be able to help you find something that'll work, if you can't find it on your own. All right, keep your introductory and concluding paragraphs very brief. I do not want them to be like extremely long. I guess by very brief, I mean like less than half a page. That's what I'm envisioning, but no more than half a page, okay? Sometimes I see these introductions that go on for a long time and I'm just like, you are wasting valuable space um, and it's not even useful here. So don't do that. You, you need a thesis statement in the introduction Paper requires body paragraphs. All bar body paragraphs need topic sentences, but also textual evidence. And then if you have a quote, you have to have analysis afterwards. This is just basic composition stuff, but I wanted to make sure to tell you that. Um, there is a writing center on campus. Take advantage of that if you think it would be helpful. Um, I think it's helpful regardless of, you know, if you're a senior or a freshman, but I do highly recommend the writing center too. Just search for writing center on Loyola's website and you'll be able to find it. Although, um, I wonder if I gave a link. Yeah, I gave you a link down here for the Writing Center too. Okay, so you must quote or paraphrase from at least three sources. That's going to be one scholarly plus two others. The two others could be scholarly if you want, but they don't have to be. Um, the texts from the class um, don't count for that. You can use them, but they don't count for these source requirements. Okay, so just make sure that you look at this, that you have an awareness of, of what you need to do. Okay, so the main point is because the upcoming assignments are needing your attention as well, I highly recommend that you take the exam early um, to give yourself time to begin working on other assignments. Now, it's up to you. Just make sure that you look on the schedule and have a, a good sense of what's to when. All right, so other issues that I wanted to discuss with you are um, what's going on, some other points about Stryker, and then all things related to Bornstein. OK, so let's look at that quickly. Now, I gave you some discussion questions for Stryker. So make sure you have a sense on how to answer these. I think it's pretty self-explanatory if you look at the readings. Um, so for that first question, why is defining homosexuality and heterosexuality as stable and normative categories of personhood dangerous? That's on 214, okay? So I just took this exactly from page 214. Let me make this a little bigger for you. Um, so most disturbingly, transgender uh, studies... Transgender increasingly functions as a site in which it contains all gender trouble, therefore helping to secure both homosexuality and heterosexuality as stable and normative um, categories of personhood. So why is that dangerous? They, they act like this is very problematic, so here's the answer. This has, this has damaging, isolative, political cor cor <laughs> corollaries. Sorry. Um, it is the same developmental logic that transformed an anti-assimilationist queer politics into a more palatable LGBT civil rights movement, with T reduced to merely another easily detached genre of sexual identity rather than perceived. Like race or class is something that cuts across existing sexualities, revealing in often unexpected ways the means through which all identities achieve their spe specificity. So, 
Um, when you define homosexuality and heterosexuality as stable and normative, you are um, reducing the possibilities of of how everyone is supposed to be normal. It makes normalcy seem like the intent. But how is normal, normalcy typically defined? It's typically defined in terms of who has the most power. I mean, that's not usually what people are thinking, but that ends up being true. So if you're looking at like any of the representation issues that we've seen in Hollywood recently, you know, why is it that there's so many white middle class or rich people being represented um, in movies and film? Well. Because those are the people that, that that have a ton of money to make films, who have the most power in the industry, who have, like, even when you're talking about casting, those are the biggest stars because they've had the most opportunities to be um, in lead positions. Um, so all of the, the power is there among white people. And then you also look at white middle class and upper middle class people. Right. So the people who buy movie tickets... Um, that's that's who these studios are trying to appeal to. Now, of course, everyone can buy movie tickets regardless of race, and actually even um, regardless of most, not most, but many classes. Um, people are consuming media in, in all sorts of class um, positions. So why is it that they're marketing so much to white people? Because white people have, up to this point, made up the largest um, pool of people who are buying tickets. But what would happen if Hollywood just changed? Maybe more Asian people, Latino people, all these other people would go too. So that's just one example for you to see how, um, how when you think of something as normal, you're usually thinking of something as the people in most power because they have the most power to represent themselves or to be represented. So when you think of those things, this is going to mark out a lot of people. It's going to make a lot of people unable to be a part of things, um, and it's going to make it's going to make um, well another reason too that I wanted to bring it up was that thinking of homosexuality and heterosexuality as stable and normative categories of personhood. Um, rely on gender being stable, okay? You cannot have homosexuality without homo, without same, right? You can't have homosexuality without man plus man equals gay, or woman plus woman equals gay. You can't have that category at all without gender being stable, okay? So what happens when gender becomes unstable, when there are people who are able to change genders, when you have people who, who are assigned genders, or not even assigned, who claim genders that are outside of a gender binary, who claim to be something else besides man or woman, then heterosexuality, homosexuality become unstable. So when you look at trying to allow homosexuality and heterosexuality to both be stable normative categories, you are keeping a lot of people out and you are just reifying or, or supporting the very structures that, um, that assign gender um, based on you know, biological essentialism and also um, are strictly within the confines of, of the gender binary. So it's very dangerous for a variety of reasons to think of homosexuality or heterosexuality being stable categories. So something that this reading talks a lot about is heteronormativity, which we've talked about in class before with the previous striker reading. This is the idea of, of um, you know, supporting this ideal of uh, compulsory heterosexuality and considering or assuming that everyone will be heterosexual and also participating in a system that tries to force people to be heterosexual. Okay, so what about homonormativity? Homonormativity is the same thing, where it just says, okay, you can be heterosexual or you can be homosexual, but we're still going to keep the same systems of power that allow heterosexual people to be at the top, because what kind of heterosexual people have power? The white, middle class, able-bodied. Um, you know, we, we gave that whole list uh, of things on the board that one day. You know, all these different kinds of things that define people based on how 
normal or normative they are. So all homonormativity does is add homosexual to the list and says, yes, that's possible. But transgender is a resistance to heteronormativity and it's resistance to homonormativity in the sense that it's trying to disrupt a category of gender being stable. But that's an opportunity that Stryker doesn't want you to lose. She doesn't want, um, she doesn't want there to be something like transnormativity where we're just going to add trans to the list of other normal categories. She was, she's all for this idea of queer being a resistance to the normal um, because that affords an opportunity for a, lot, a whole lot of coalition building. So remember the example in the previous striker reading about um, about um, the AIDS epidemic, the AIDS crisis, and how there are multiple categories of people who were suffering under um, heteronormativity. And so we don't want to just add homosexual using the same standards of heterosexual heterosexuality being the 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 best way to be. Um, so another example of homonormativity might be, um, you know, representations of gay people as being monogamous, getting married, um, having kids, uh, all these ideas are totally fine as options. The problem is when those become the only good representations, like a bad representation would be someone who's not monogamous. Well, actually, like a whole lot of queer people are non-monogamous and we, we shouldn't have to sanitize what, um, homosexuality is just to please heterosexual people. So homonormativity is just heteronormativity with a slight change of saying, well, homosexuals are cool too, just as long as they try to be like heterosexuals. And again, this isn't like any heterosexual, like we're not looking at, you know, poor, um, poor, uh, what's the word, what's a, we're not talking about like a poor disabled person who likes to have sex with a lot of people. We're not talking about that kind of person. That's not the kind of heterosexual person that makes it into normativity. Um, so homonormativity and heteronormativity are both putting um, the standard of what you want to be like as um, you know, upper middle class, white, able-bodied, all that kind of um, normal. All right, so another question that I'd asked with Stryker was, what's the relationship between transgender studies and disability studies? Uh, that's pretty easy. So I'll just show you down here. Um, this is the part that I was looking at. Basically it has to do with embodiment. Um, all disability studies and intersex studies investigate atypical forms of embodiment and a subjectivity. So embodiment obviously has to do with body, but subjectivity has to do with identity, the way that we, the, the way that bodies and identities are treated as subjects. Um, so the disability studies and intersex studies has a big relationship to transgender studies because of that focus on embodiment and subjectivity and in a resistance to heteronormativity as well. Okay, the other question was, what's the relationship between transgender studies and colonialism? This is pretty self-explanatory too, based on the reading. Uh, sorry, I keep pushing the wrong things. So at the end of this page, there's this discussion of colonialism, but it's really this paragraph, this whole paragraph, and this whole paragraph. Okay, so we will learn about more about this in the, in the coming unit after the exam, but uh, for now, I think these two paragraphs will suffice in terms of answering that question. other things from Stryker that I wanted to talk about. Uh, we already talked about post-identitarian uh, stuff. Anti-essentialist is, I think, pretty similar to post-identitarian. Essentialist is just, what's the thing that makes you something? Okay, so so what's the thing that makes you trans? Is there some essential idea about what it is to be trans? And I think most of the stuff that we've been reading says, no, there's so many different ways to be trans, but we are fighting against um, notions of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. There's some essentialist notions about womanhood that transgender resists, that um, rejects, and same thing about masculinity. I think everything else on here should be easy for you to find, though, and to understand. All right, in terms of Bornstein, 
there really wasn't much that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I guess I will just talk about this this quote right here on the on the first page of the Bornstein reading. Real gender freedom begins with fun. Here you get what might be called the gender blunder, a sort of whirling confusion of leather and rhinestones. These creatures do not spring full born from the forehead of the culture. Gender blunders earn their feather boa wings step by step, feather by feather. Okay, so when you're talking about gender blunder, someone who is resisting the rules of gender. Okay, so she she calls um, Bornstein calls this the gender blunder here, but a little bit later there's this idea of the clown or the fool. Um, but here, the gender blender earns their feather boa. So there's not this sense of like being born just different, being born as someone who like really loves all these things. Like gender, gender is a social construct, and resisting, resisting the social constructs that we're forced to interact with, re involves a great deal of like reward and punishment. Um, so it's it's something that you'd really have to. Um, earn, not something that just comes natural to you. It can't come natural to speak a foreign language. You'd have to you know, learn that language. You'd have to um, do the work of learning that language. Okay, and then the last thing that I want to talk about was the end of the article. There's room in, well, I guess there's two pieces. There's room in our Eurocentric culture. This is on page uh, 90. There's room, room in our Eurocentric culture for a class of clowns, jesters, tricksters, or fools. Uh, if, in fact, there are a lot of positions open, since very few people are volunteering, you know, basically she thinks that transgendered people should move into this role. You know, I think this is a really awesome concept, and I would love to hear more about what you all think about this, but since we didn't get to talk about it in class, let me just say, this is a big responsibility is a big ask basically that she's trying to put on the shoulders of trans people um, but it's something that's useful for sure so even though it's a lot to expect those who do end up doing it yeah it's a really awesome thing and I think we can look at people like Bornstein or Welchens um, or RuPaul or a whole lot of of these kind of clown fool figures um, in our culture uh, who can be really theoretically complex, or not so much, who teach us a great deal about gender. All right, and then lastly, there's the last section on this, um, in this reading, that talks about, um, you know, what are the risks of being the strictster fool? How you can be involved in speaking to a certain group. So like, let's say you're speaking to a trans audience or you're speaking to a queer audience and you're helping, you know, all of us is, all of us are going to laugh at all of these rules that this clown is making, is breaking. And when we break these rules, we're laughing at culture for assuming that everyone should be straight or assuming that everybody shouldn't be trans. But she says there's a danger in speaking too much to the audience um, that that you can become accepted too much. And when you become accepted too much, you start catering yourself to that audience. So let's say that you're trying to speak to a trans audience um, and you're trying to make jokes about cis people, for example. But in that process, what you can end up doing um, is missing out on opportunities to continue to break the rules, to continue to show how the rules um, should be broken. So for instance, what about one of those one of these things about, not one of these things, but what about if you're talking to a trans audience, um, let's say a bunch of binary trans people and you're making jokes about that and then and then you push it even further and you say some, okay, so let's say you're talking about, um, about trans dudes, for instance, and trans dudes are trying to be masculine and they're trying to be read as trans dudes, I'm sorry, trans men, trans dudes, trans guys, whatever, um, trans masculine people who are binary identified Okay, so masculinity is important to them. They want to be identified as men. They want to be identified as he. So a clown figure might say something like, hey girl, to a trans guy, that would make an audience uncomfortable, right? But maybe that's the role of the clown is to make them uncomfortable because why would that make a trans guy uncomfortable to be called girl in that kind of like, hey girl, how you doing kind of way? Well, that would make them uncomfortable because that's not what they are, that they're a guy. But when a clown in this kind of performance setting does that, that does help us see that 
disregard for femininity and the root of of queer and trans movement in um in the kind of like street queen um family kind of gathering so i'm not saying i don't think that that it's good to misgender anybody anytime but in a performance setting that could be useful if not like really awesome and making people uncomfortable so let's say you don't misgender someone but you're speaking to people who are expecting to have that strict binary gender idea and you somehow re-emphasized the idea of gender being malleable then that is going to um again help break the rules help break the idea that these binary folks should be so should be so binary or what about breaking what if you're speaking to a bunch of people who are totally into non-binariness and queer identity queer gender identities gender queerness non-binary gender fluid like what if you're talking about uh, talking to a group of people like that well you know it's good to have those jokes that we're all the insiders and then we can laugh at that but what about making some jokes that really talks about how cis person can feel very attached to it their binary identity or how a trans person can feel very attached maybe those kinds of jokes are are good to make us feel uncomfortable and realize that we can't just say a gender it just floats around because sometimes it floats around and lands somewhere okay so that's all i really wanted to say about bornstein okay so now i'm going to answer your questions but actually i didn't get any questions um after 5 30 so I won't answer any of your questions, um, but if you do end up having any questions, you can email me and I will answer them as I'm able. So we end up talking about everything that I needed to talk about in this video, and um, and that's really it. So keep calm, good luck with the exam. Let me know if you do have questions. Uh, again, thanks for your flexibility with all of this, and I will uh, see you when we return on Wednesday next week. All right, bye.